You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Susan Downs and Alex Voss, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Glad to be here. Likewise. This is great. I'm excited to have you guys on. I just watched your film, The Big Secret. You guys produced it. You guys made it. You had a lot of a lot of really influential people in the health space talking about a lot of um, uh, this topic of really the failure of the mainstream medical system. And there was a lot of interesting points made in it. There was a lot of things that were that were new to me that I know most people don't know. So I'm just curious, just to kind of start, what was your why did you make the film? What, what was your reason for making the film? Well, I guess I could start when I started the film. I've been making documentaries and video programs for a number of years. And my health was going way downhill. I was 360 pounds. I was doing everything the doctor told me. And uh, I was continually getting sicker. And so one of the ways I learn about something, I, I realized if you do a documentary about something, uh, that's the way to really learn about it if you're producing a documentary because I guess you access to people that are knowledgeable about the subject. So I started this documentary not really knowing where I would go with it. I was trying to just find out what the truth was in the matter because when you go online and you listen to people, you get a lot of conflicting data about what is good for your health. And so on that quest, when I was just going trying to find people to interview – I ran across Dr. Susan Downs. She became the co-producer of the film. And uh, and I had a lot of stunning revelations about the healthcare system in which we all live. And, it, you know, when I, when I used to believe, there was a time I believed that everybody had my best interest at heart when I went to the doctor's office. And I came to the conclusion after doing the movie that we actually live in a medical system. And I'm saying doctors are wonderful. I'm not criticizing doctors. But the big pharma agri system and some other influences in there like the FDA and so forth uh, are functioning more for monetary gain than health and well-being of the patient. And it, it, it turned out to be a frightening revelation. And so what I found out was I had to dramatically change my paradigm about what health what made someone healthy. You know, a doctor would never tell you to change your nutrition. They just give you a pill usually and you go on. And uh, so I had to dramatically change the way I did things to get healthier. And so this this movie was the genesis of me trying to learn about that. But I did. We did run across several uh, frightening revelations and situations during the movie. So I'm going to ask Dr. Susan to chime in at that point. Well, to me, health should be about finding the underlying cause and addressing it rather than just putting band-aids on symptoms. I mean, by definite, I mean, as a physician, we want to help and we feel helpless when we can't. So I think there's motivation. Oh, let me give you a pill that would at least help. And that's the paradigm a lot of people are in. Let me give you a pill to help. But the pills are, if you look at it, just about everything, they're masking the symptoms. Okay, pills for high blood pressure. Well, it means your high, your blood pressure is high. What does that do to? Is it due to excessive salt intake? Is it due to lack of magnesium? Is it due to diet? Um, same with diabetes. I mean, pre-diabetes, I mean, it probably th- 30% of us in the Western world have this, and it's a continuum. It's not just you walk in and your doctor says, oh, your morning blood sugar is 126. Here's a T-shirt. Here's the hat. You're welcome to the club. Welcome to the club of diabetes. So we need to look underneath at what's putting us in this direction. And we just want to give people information how to be proactive in their health. Yeah, that's you just nailed it on the head. And this is where my health journey began too, was, was needing care and not getting a solution, just getting band-aid after band-aid after band-aid. And for me, it was when I was younger and it was just antibiotics. It was a lot of antibiotics in my teens. And, you know, when you're in the teens, you're in in the nineties, nobody talked about this stuff. And now that I'm in my thirties, 
I feel like I'm still recovering from, uh, you know, from those doses of antibiotics, you know, I didn't know I was just nuclear bombing all of this very important gut microbiota. And later on down the road, it would manifest as, I mean, gut issues, skin issues, emotional issues, um, you know, b- blood pressure issues, just everything that has to do with the gut. I've experienced those symptoms. And had I not drawn away from the standard allopathic model, I mean, I'd be broke right now. I would have, I would be in debt, you know, and this is why people, so many people are in debt because they just keep going back for more and more. And the, and they, they, a lot of people just never question their doctor. Well, you know, in the, in the movie, I have a video that I videotaped of a Catholic priest who's got a briefcase, uh, attache case full of pill bottles that were prescribed to him. Uh, by his various doctors. And so he was taking 32 pills a day, three times a day. And eventually his liver failed because of all the the pharmaceuticals he was taking. And so they put him in hospice because of the liver failure. You're going to die. You know, that's what they told him. And they took him off all the pills he was taking. And all of a sudden his liver turned around. He got healthier. And then they put him, they, they, he wasn't going to die in the hospice. So they put him in the uh, you know uh, apartment to stay in for a while. Then they put him on back on all the drugs, and then he turned back around, and then he died. And I found that very interesting, especially even with a Catholic priest. And so it's out of control. You know, the doctors are working; they're not seeing what people are taking in the interactions, and and what this stuff is doing to them. You know, I'm not saying all pharmaceuticals are bad, but I'm saying if you can find a natural alternative, you're a lot better off or something that would eliminate dysfunction other than something that is synthetic. Well, in the end, it's chemistry, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is biochemistry. This is the, we're, our bodies are laboratories and these chemicals are highly volatile and they call these things side effects, but really it's the effect, you know, when you're, when you have a genetic code that is built for a certain um, that, that's basically the directions of how your body works. And then, you know, you factor in all of the physical stimuli you have just in your day, things you don't even realize, like chemicals in your water and chemicals in your, uh, you know, in your environment and glyphosate on your food. And then you start putting in these chemicals that were synthesized in a lab and they were marketed for one purpose, but really do all of these other things because, you know, receptors in the body are, you know, sometimes unpredictable and we still don't know the science of the body. And so, you know, you have these side effects and then you go back to a doctor and a doctor says, okay, you got that side effect, but we're going to give you another thing for that side effect. And then another side effect pops up and they give you another thing for that thing. And it's just, I've, and I've seen these people, in real life, I mean, the attache, the, uh, the the briefcase in that film, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen that briefcase before. I've seen people's pill boxes, you know, and it's, and anybody who's ever worked in a restaurant knows when you go to serve a table, you see these pill boxes and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, yeah, it's that's not, true. It's, it's all about money. You know, the more pills they can sell, the more money they make. And uh, instead of just curing somebody, you know, they, they, you, they, give you a, they give you a statin drug, which is really bad for you. And instead of just saying, donate blood, exercise a little more, eat differently, that will give you a better shot at not having a heart attack than taking a statin drug. But they don't tell you how to actually cure the problem. They say, here, take a statin drug. And then you have all the damage from that. And, and you know, there's correlations that show a lot of of problems with taking statin drugs and other types of pharmaceuticals, but there's also stuff in the food. So you're getting a whole load of toxins in whatever you eat if you're not very careful. I see this a lot with the statins. Um, you know, I have family members on statins and it frightens me and I've, I've watched, you know, cognitive decline. I haven't seen them get healthier. And I think a lot of it, most of it is fear-based, you know, when you go in and the doctor says your cholesterol is, you know, is high. I mean, you, you, you have this automatic association that cholesterol is high. I'm going to have a heart attack. What's the solution to a heart attack? Get the cholesterol low. How do you do that? 
the stat. And so the, the math is already done in your head. You, the sales pitch has already been done in your head. The, the doctor just has to say, you know, and the doctor has the authority, the doctor, you respect the doctor. And like you said, I don't, I'm not going to come out and just start blaming doctors. Doctors are under some really intense, um, uh, you know, they're under some real intense criteria to get patients in and out. These doctor's offices are busier than ever. They only have 10 minutes, sometimes less than that to see a patient. I mean, how can you dive into a full health history of somebody and really understand what they need versus, well, you know, this pharma rep came in with, you know, bleach tips and just graduated college. And, uh, you know, they're listening to, uh, you know, hip hop or whatever on their, on their iPad. And then they, they roll in, they tell me they got some pamphlets. They tell me got, uh, cruise ship tickets for me if I dish out this much of this. So who am I to question these guys? You know, it, it's uh, it's a tough situation for everybody. Yeah. It's very unfortunate, but uh, the bottom line is it's killing a lot of people yeah, as far as them dying prematurely and all the suffering they go through unnecessarily because of the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, for cholesterol, half the people who have heart attacks, their cholesterol is normal and we need cholesterol. We make 80 percent of our cholesterol. So why don't we look at why? Why are we making so much if that's an issue? Um, mm -hmm. We need cholesterol for our sex hormones and cell walls and lowering cholesterol. It's not clear that that that, that has anything to do with reducing heart attacks. I'm curious because I know you you have a um, psychology background, Dr. Downs. And yeah. do you see any correlations between the war on cholesterol as in, you know, lowering th this, this race to, to the bottom of lowering cholesterol and psychological issues? Well, I see a rather simplistic way to look at the world. There's good and there's bad and there's no grays. And we've got to have this war on drugs, war on opiates, war on uh, cholesterol. But it was misguided. I mean, it's not the cholesterol that's the problem. It's the sugar we eat. I mean, one molecule of sugar might take over 20 molecules of magnesium. And so it's going to deplete all your nutrients. It's going to lead to high insulin. It's going to lead to insulin resistance, It's going to, which leads to inflammation, oxidative stress and everything. And toxins is an important role in this because there's several different toxins that will lead you to diabetes um, through different mechanisms. Some of the toxins will affect the receptors. Others will affect affect the islet cells that make the insulin. And so you get a real whammy. And I mean, I've, I've, I've had a radio po podcast called Occupy Health. And some of the people said, if you've got no inflammation or oxidative stress, you don't have any disease. If you don't have any disease, you don't have any oxidative stress. And all these toxins cause oxidative stress. So it's kind of a big symphony. We've got to look at all the contributing factors. I mean, even uh, interestingly enough about Alzheimer's, there's this guy named Dale Bredesen, who says there's all these contributing factors to Alzheimer's. So let's pick the eight main ones, fix it. I mean, he's reversed cognitive decline. I've written articles on autism, same thing. It's a final common pathway of everything gone wrong. I've seen women uh, with very autistic kids who couldn't even communicate, but one woman, uh, I guess Dr. Reed, um, her kid became the most social kid in school by eliminating glutamate and diet. Another person, uh, the kid regained function by eliminating gluten. Every kid's different and, you know, and different problems. So, I mean, it's multifactorial. For Alzheimer's, uh, Dr. Bredesen has put five different categories of it. One is the one related to insulin because they call Alzheimer's, for example, diabetes three. And so, it's you know, you get the high sugars, the insulin goes high, insulin resistance, and the whole thing goes downhill with inflammation, oxidative stress. Another one he calls the catabolic anabolic. Anabolic is when you're building, catabolic when you're tearing apart. And that form of Alzheimer's, a catabolic tearing apart is greater than the anabolic. The third category of Alzheimer's, you calls due to toxins and then the other two are permutations of the above so so many different factors but just to give a pill because you know it's all so you find one symptom oh my god the cholesterol is high let's give statins what do statins do they affect the nerve coverings so you get all these muscle issues uh they um lower adiponectin so it's kind of a pathway to diabetes um, they lower CoQ10, so that's going to give you a mitochondria, your energy producing a shock. Your mitochondria goes down, everything starts to go down. It's all interconnected. But I've been in several 
doctor's offices and when my cholesterol has been 200, which is, you know, anything under 225, you've got a, you know, less chance of dying than above, but they keep wanting to give me a statin. And I asked them, don't you care why my cholesterol is at this horrible value of 200? And I told them I've got a very high lipoprotein A and this, you know, at an extremely well-known university. What's that? <laughs> It's an immutable risk factor. Statins ain't going to do squat. So, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, the 10 minute interviews where they, you know, they've got this knee jerk reaction. They want to help. And this pre-programmed reaction that even a computer can do. Here's your statin. It's not serving us. It's not. It's not. And I, I uh, years ago, I read this really interesting book. It's called Overdosed. And I, I couldn't tell you the author, but it's um, it was a guy. I believe he. Um, I think he was in an emergency. I don't remember exactly what his specialty in medicine was. He might have even been a lawyer of some sort, but he was talking about this exact thing, you know, this exact dynamic of people getting prescribed all of these medications and the 10 minute interview in the doctor's office. And, and really, like, how does that happen? And there is a lot that falls on the doctor's shoulders, but so much of this is due to patients demanding these medications. You know, they go in and they don't want to leave without a medication. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but probably one of the biggest ones is the direct to consumer marketing. And when they started allowing that, I forget the year, it might've been in the early nineties or something. There was a law that was passed and, uh, and they basically said, you can advertise pharmaceutical companies can advertise direct to consumers. And then you started seeing all of these pharma ads on, um, you know, TV. It's, I haven't had a TV. I haven't had a TV for for uh, about a decade now. And every time I, I, I get to a TV, like in a hotel room or something, I'll flick on the news and I'm just blown away by how, but it's, it's maybe two car commercials and the rest of it's all pharma ads, you know, or if you watch football or something, it's, it's, you know, a car commercials, beer commercials, McDonald's commercials and pharma ads. And so people and the pharma ads are super slick. They don't talk about the drug in a 30 second commercial. They'll mention the drug twice. And then it's a guy like on a rowboat or something, uh, or, you know, people playing volleyball or going out for ice cream, but it's, it's for like a statin drug or an antidepressant. And it's this subliminal marketing. I think just people get into the doctor's office and they demand the drug. Well, you know, the, the scary part about that is, that um, when the advertising revenue going to like the news corporations uh, comes from Big Pharma, they're never going to say anything bad about Big Pharma. You know, the it, like the whoever pick your 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 cable news network or your your local TV, they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them because that's where their money comes from. And even though there's been some really horrific problems with with pharmaceuticals you're not going to see a lot of that on the news because basically the pharmaceutical companies own the news companies you know the news reporting agencies to a, a large extent because that's where their money comes from and you know that's one thing when when we went to do the film i just wanted to come out with the truth i wanted to have the answers i tried to make them as simple as possible as quick as possible you know how did we get here why is this going on? And then we, we went through a, a, a sequence of events that explained you have this problem, you have another problem. Like we, we talked about uh, hexafluorosilicic acid in the water. We talked about high fructose corn syrup and how we have this huge spike in obes obesity and diabetes and all the dysfunction because we switched from sugar to high fructose corn syrup and all the effects that had. And so we, we, I, I, I tried with Susan and she really helped me, you know, get this all worked out to at least put the basic things, the major things that are affecting our health. And I thought, you know, when people see this, they'll just they'll be crazy about it. They'll love it. And we have a, had a lot of good response. But we also ran into a lot of censorship on this because we were we were stepping on some pretty big toes when we started telling the truth of the matter about what's going on with our health. Yeah, thank you, Congressman Adam Schiff. I mean, thank God we've got him to tell us what we can watch and what we can't watch. And I'm concerned about the news nowadays because they're making all these recent protests look like the summer of eternal love. And I mean, I just wonder if we can even trust any news reporting anywhere. 
Well, I mean, as terrible as it is, this is why I, I, in such an awful way, I laugh when they talk about the opioid crisis because, you know, the, the CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and whoever it is, they'll come on and they'll report about the opioid crisis and they'll have, you know, experts come on and they'll talk about the opioid crisis. And it's always like, we have no idea how the opioid crisis just exploded. Well, maybe it's probably because you're sponsored by <laughs> companies that make opioids, you know, maybe it's the news that we're getting is their bills are paid from the companies that are actually producing the opioids and then they run commercials for these very opioids and people go to the doctors and ask for them. And well, let, it's, me tell, let me tell you what I mean, what I've seen, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, I would have made opiates and benzodiazepines such as Valium, et cetera, like the plague. I wouldn't give them. Then the medical board comes out and says, we've got to treat pain. We cannot have people in pain. You've got to take 12 hours on pain management and you have to give them the opiates because, you know, you can't be cruel to these people. And we had to take 12 hours. And as, as I recall, the gist is you've got to give them the opiates. And then now it's swung another way. So they brought the medical board on board on this. And the medical board is, is paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. Oh, follow the money. <laughs> There's a lot of influence going on from big pharma. They tend to run the FDA and everybody that could interfere with what they would do. Oh, let me tell you about the FDA. Oh, you want to get into stuff that's juicy. Um, uh, we've got memos. Um, the FDA scientists said, do not proceed with GMOs. There's a lot of questions here. They proceeded. Uh, we had memos uh, that, you know, the sugar industry is trying to bribe Harvard. Uh, we've also interviewed a guy named E.G. Bellionados that worked for the EPA. This is in the next film. That worked for the EPA for 25 years, and they never had any studies. That was a fake lab to do the looking at the pesticides. He never mentioned Monsanto, but I assume that they're prominent in this and that they never had the test. They just made up all the studies and. I don't think our government's serving us well. You can look at any government agency, and there's a revolving door between the very high executives and the industry they're monitoring, and it's just a revolving door. Pick any agency, FCC, FDA, EP, uh, you know, it's just something's wrong. And I feel our Congress is being bought. And and how do they do that? How do they how do they fake studies? I, I've always wondered about that. You know, like I've heard of ghost writers. I've heard of, but I, but who does that? Because it it seems like these. I'm I'm not going to just say these scientists have bad intentions. You know, but I, I'm is it a thing where they just kind of backdoor it and they leave the papers on their desk and they say your assignment today is to essentially sign these papers and those papers essentially okay these studies. I, I I just don't get how that works. Well, check in the Monsanto papers because there's a lot of data that the Monsanto people are actually writing the articles and they get some doctor to go along with it. Uh, according to Valionados, they had a lab. They did two months of studies with results, and then they just made up the rest. And the lab was a fraud. Um, research studies, I mean, Kelly Brogan in our movie mentioned, you, I mean, this is one case of, you know, 38 studies of uh, things that came out positively, they published things that came out negatively, they didn't have to. And she said it was like throwing dice. I mean, you just keep doing a study until one comes out your way and you don't have to mention the others. I don't, but I think money is a motivating factor. There are a lot, I mean, there are some people, I mean, look at the thing on hydrochloroquine. I mean, it just came out that, oh, this is horrible. And then they had to retract the article. I mean, yeah, that, that's a prime the, example there. And the studies done by industry, pick anything, FCC and EMF and stuff. And the studies done by the industry overwhelmingly show this is God's gift to mankind. And the independent researchers say, wait a minute, there's a lot of risk here. And it looks like our Congress doesn't care about risk. They're forcing GMOs on us. They're forcing 5G on us, fluoridating the water, all these toxins. And, you know, they, they, they don't care. I mean, all these things have such adverse health effects. And why isn't any, anybody care about this? It's, there was such a circus in Washington for the last three years. Nobody noticed they were censoring. The CEO of YouTube said that, she, that, that YouTube's going to censor information on vitamin C and curcumin. What the F? Wow. It's, it's frightening because, you know, vitamin C is one of the best things to keep you well. And the, and the head of YouTube says, you know, that as if vitamin C was some sort of quackery when it's been around for years. 
And, uh, you know, that's the thing, you know, we, with this uh, COVID-19, if you can <clears throat> develop your immunity by taking quality vitamins and supplements to a point where your body's better able to deal with an infection, that's a good place to start. And, you know, there's all this stuff about the, uh, the hydroxychloroquine, you know, when you, uh, it, there was a lot of evidence. There's a lot of doctors that really have a lot of success, they say, with hydroxychloroquine, but it's an inexpensive drug. And there, it's like they're pushing away the inexpensive <clears throat> ways of treating a problem because they wanted to make the way for something that's expensive and profitable. And doctors' and, offices, <clears throat> if they were giving out vitamin C, were raided by the FBI and they were given a gag order. Wow. I didn't know that. The, the hydroxychloroquine thing is, is, is interesting to me because, I, I, I mean, I'll be the first to say I don't know much about it. I know people use it for lupus. I know they, it's a malaria drug. And I've also heard that it is super cheap. Um, and actually, one of the first videos, I followed this guy. He's a, um, he's, a, he's a medical professor on YouTube. And, he, you know, when COVID first started, he was putting out these COVID daily updates. And, um, and he, was, he was just kind of following the studies and the papers. And one of his first videos on COVID was doctors are seeing success with zinc and hydroxychloroquine. And then I started hearing all the negative press to it. And of course, because I'm in this world and I've, you know, ever since I, ever since I jumped the shark into holistic health versus the sick care system, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's an innate bullshit sensor in my brain that goes off whenever I start hearing, um, you know, words like debunked and quackery. And I always, I always smell something fishy. And when they start coming out, especially when, when the president starts saying like, there's evidence we might use it. Granted, I would not, I would not put my, you know, health, um, uh, integrity on someone like, Trump, but at the same time, it's like I understand this media battle that's going on. Basically, what I'm saying is, is the hydroxychloroquine thing has been so over politicized in the same way that all of these other remedies like vitamin C, you know, even before the COVID thing happened, that not only do I not know what to think, every time I hear a quote unquote expert say about how bad hydroxychloroquine is, and I've seen the studies come out that say that, that it, that the studies that they were doing on it had to be stopped because they weren't even being done correctly. Um, the whole thing throws the whole, the whole process into question. Well, well you know, the, the, go ahead. Um, well, well, Silicon Valley Health Institute, we've had weekly Zoom meetings on experts on COVID, including an Irish virologist and some of the top people. And they're all saying vitamin C, vitamin D, and the hydrochloroquine you have to take with zinc. Virologist uh, Dolores Cahill from Ireland says that you know that you only need two or three of the pills of hydrochloroquine, and you have to take it with zinc because it escorts the zinc into the cell, so zinc can do its thing. But uh, um, the only one or two pills, and the r risk with hydrochloroquine is uh, cardiac arrhythmias and problems. So you can monitor people in their QTC interval and their heart condition, or you can just monitor those people and not give it to them. And she says you only need one or two pills because the half-life is three weeks. So I'm not an expert on it, but we have weekly Zoom meetings with S experts. It's S as in Sally, V as in Victor, H as in Health, I, Silicon Valley Health Institute. These are weekly Zoom meetings, and you can tune in and ask the experts questions. You know, one of the interesting things about the negative things they said about hydroxychloroquine, if you look at the research studies that were with the VA hospital, that was mainly data dredging. They didn't follow the protocols that you would normally follow to actually do a good research study. And there was this mystery corporation that appeared, and it was basically something like... Um, uh, Cambridge Analytica for hydroxychloroquine. Here's this a mystery, cor uh, mystery corporation that just appeared. They do a lot of negative information, but it's just a front. And, it, you know, it didn't have anything to do with real research. Yet that's taken as the most expert study when there's so many doctors that say good things about it. I don't know if it's good or bad particularly, but I do know there's a lot of doctors that seem to think it's very useful. And, and here's this research study debunked because there was this false entity that came into the play of the study. And then they had to 
reverse what they said about it because they found out this was a fake company. That's the problem with so many studies is we're, we're so subservient to them. And yet there's so many of these like statistical manipulations and, uh, um, you know, inaccurate ways of even doing the data. Like, uh, I heard this guy, Brett Weinstein on the Joe Rogan podcast a couple of days ago, talking about how all of these, I forget what drug it was, but you know, uh, rats, they use in these drug trials. Um, they don't have the correct genetic sequence or, or, or they don't have like the, cor- they're not the correct of rats essentially to be doing these studies with in the first place. Place. And he raised this to these different medical boards and they basically shut him down. Yet he has the data to prove that, you know, when we do a rat study and the rats and, and the fact that we're relying on rats to tell us how our human body works, I think that's a little goofy. But the fact that these rats have these genetic mutations or these or these in innate um inaccurate responses to things and we put all of our weight to make important medical decisions on that and we can't even have that debate um but yet these medical journals that we know have been bought off by big pharma are the ones that are dictating all of the medical policy i think i think we got to start there well yeah i mean you know the thing is i I like like you i have that sensor the the BS sensor when I start hearing a lot of this stuff and then there's a ring of truth over here. But the bottom line is, you know, if you, if you look at basic biochemistry and how the body works, and I've, 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 I, I'm not an expert, I'm a filmmaker, but I've been interviewing experts all over the place. And there's a consensus that the body, you, you follow the basic biochemistry and you do, you give the body what it needs to function the body is smart enough to figure out how to function if you give it the materials it needs to function. And you remove the toxins that get in the way of it working. And that's basically a simple thing that you can really improve your health dramatically just by the foods you eat, the avoidance of toxins, and so forth. The toxins are the big one. Um, you know, the more the more I also speak to experts uh, in these fields, the more I, I believe a lot of doctors and a lot of people are on board with this idea that the toxic burden in our world right now is just overwhelming. Um, and this is why supplementation is so necessary because, you know, we have these two million year old bodies that just in the last hundred years have, have now had to adapt very quickly to, I don't know how thousands of new chemicals that were just introduced and we're just figuring out how they work in the body and, and pair that on top of the fact that we're just being overloaded with these chemicals, you know, our food being sprayed with these, with these pesticides. And, you know, like you guys talked about in the film, the fluoride in the water that we're being told is necessary for our teeth where there's no actual real data to even back that up. And it's, it's causing all of these neurological, I mean, there's so many elements that cause these neurological problems, but you know, the really strange thing about fluoride and, and no one ever talks about this but they, they have to put tons of hexafluorosilicic acid in the water supply, supposedly to help with, uh, with uh, dental caries so the, chil- the children don't have cavities. But the thing is, if, if fluoride is so good for, for, for dental health for children, why is the fluoride only put in the areas of town or the municipalities that are poor? You do not have fluoridation in wealthy areas in the United States. In Dallas, Texas, we have an area called uh, University Park, Island Park. They do not fluoridate. They do not fluoridate in the Hamptons. And if you look at the zip codes that have wealthy people, they do not fluoridate as a rule. Like Beverly Hills, California, they don't fluoridate because they say the the fluoride's already naturally in the water. But if you do a fluoride test, there really isn't fluoride in the water. But you, you go to like the poor people, the people that are lower income, they have heavy amounts of fluoridation, and this is a neurotoxin. If you if children grow up drinking fluoridated water, they can lose up to 10 points of their IQ for life. Yeah, and also why on a tube of toothpaste, you know, like a couple of years ago, if you eat too much of it, why do you have to call poison control? 
So what is in it? And there's several other chemicals I've read, one being lead and there's another chemical. I don't know which one it was, but each of these can lower kids' IQs by five points. So does that explain what we see going on today? I mean, you get three chemicals, you could lower it up to 15 points. Yeah. And to the adults too. And not to mention, there's also the idea of like this, this transgenerational response where we're just hand, like we're handing these toxins down to kids and then to grandkids. You know, I've seen studies where they say that, uh, you know, a mother exposed to, um, I don't remember exactly if it was lead or mercury or, or one of these chemicals that their grandchildren will, will still, that will carry on all the way down to the grandchildren, you know? So, um, and that's the same thing I believe for, for, uh, for metabolic syndrome, for diabetes, um, you know, where you feel the effects of the food and the chemicals that your grandmother was exposed to. And if you think that, and if, well, we know that the chemicals just becoming more and more abundant in the environment, and if they're already getting passed down, like if I'm feeling my grandma's chemicals from the 1950s, I can't imagine what my grandkids are going to feel, uh, you know, 70 years from now or whatever it is. It's just, it's the, the, the chemical thing is, um, it is pretty wild. And, and this is why I stress things like detoxification and, and, and proper detoxification, you know, sweating and, and just really focusing on, sometimes it's not about taking in more. Sometimes it's about, you know, figuring out how to properly eliminate. And that right. gets you to the microbiome where people's microbiomes are so jacked up that they can't, they can't eliminate, you know, you have people who are like, I poop once a week. Like that's terrible. Yeah. That's, that's the thing is, you know, uh, we're, we're at a point in time where getting good nutrition is very difficult. The, you know, the, the food has had a real decline in its nutrient value, nutrient value since the 1970s. Uh, Professor Donald Davis at UT Texas Austin and his team of researchers found real declines in food over the last half century. So if you were eating an apple in 1970, it had a lot of vitamin A in it, whereas now it doesn't generally speaking. And so you're not getting the nutrition. And and you're, what that leads to is people that are not going to be as healthy as they used to. And you look at the biomarkers of aging for people that are in high school now. Now, that's not true for everybody, but overall, the aging markers for, for students in high school is, uh, I've heard, as, as high as 40 years old in some cases. And so if they're 40-year-old, and their bio age is 40 years old when they're coming out of high school. How old are they going to be when they're 40? You know, and that indicates a decreased lifespan lifespan for people that are teenagers now. And it's a frightening prospect and no one seems to cover that. Yeah. And when you walk through a high school and you see the food that the kids are eating, you know, mm -hmm. I remember my high school, like the big thing was it, when we had a Taco Bell in our high school. Mm -hmm. And it was like the first time we had a Taco Bell. And I, it was like, of course, I was like 16. Of course, I'm going to go get Taco Bell every single day with a Coke, you know, and there's, there's soda machines and snack machines all over the, you know, with all of these chemicals that we know lower IQ and have these devastating effects on metabolism and, and fat and, you know, even cause cancer. Well, you see, the fast foods are designed to be addictive, Mm -hmm. They put they put like, you know, the high fructose corn syrup, which is an addictive thing. If you if you start consuming high fructose corn syrup or sugar, it's it's the same as being an addict to any drug. You're going to want more and more and more. And so, you know, if you can manufacture foods that make people want to continuously eat it, whether it's not even if it's not good for them, that's a money making thing. And so uh, what do you think, Susan? Yeah, well, Lustig's most recent book was kind of, you know, hacking of corporate America or something. He mentions that, like, the food, you know, are stimulated to increase your dopamine, which is the chemical involved in addiction. And, you know, and that kind of leads to pleasure, whereas serotonin, he connects more with happiness. So, uh, yeah, I mean... That's the, I mean, I'm sure these companies have marketers and people studying how to, you know, get people to respond on TV. I mean, you know, waiting for a click on your cell phone that gets adrenaline going 
get your dopamine going so they have a certain delay or something. I mean, I'm sure they've got experts calculating this to, you know, get us uh, subconsciously to want these things. I mean, you know, I mean, who's, who can resist a donut when it comes in? Oh, glazed and warm. Yeah, donuts are best when, uh, when the uh, hydrogenated fat hasn't congealed yet. Oh, I don't know. It's just something yum, yum. And then I feel yuck later. It is amazing when you start to when you start to turn it around and you you start to realize like oh I feel I feel better naturally and you know I think I'm getting healthy and then you have a donut <laughs> and you feel that brain fog and that crash and I mean it lasts for for some people for a couple of days you know and you just realize like wow there are people who feel this every single day. And it's just their normal. It's just yeah. the normal to feel this lull. And, and then it gets diagnosed as depression. And then they get on the pills. And then the whole thing starts. Well, you know, hydrogenated oil used to, was invented as a lubricant. They invented it to lubricate uh, submarines. And it didn't work as a submarine lubricant. So they tried to make soap out of it. And it didn't make it soap, but they realized when you fried in it, things were crispy. But hydrogenated oil, uh, the vegetable oils are very, very unhealthy. Yeah, lots of inflammation. And um, so, yeah, and canola oil was originally a motor oil, very highly processed, very bad for the health. Glyphosate is an antibiotic. It's going to affect your gut and a chelator. So you can just grab on to anything. It can open your blood brain barrier like EMF and just carry the chelated stuff right into the brain. The oil is the biggest mind fuck, I really believe. The, the, the vegetable oil, the fact they call it vegetable oil. And I, you know, here in Puerto Rico, I, I don't remember seeing this when I was in the States. I lived in New York for a while and they try to, you know, have this kind of woke health consciousness thing in New York. So I feel like I was kind of removed from the mainstream American, um, you know, kind of junk food industrial complex for a little while. But now that I'm in Puerto Rico and I'll go to Costco or just even driving around, it's the way that they market vegetable oil and they call it heart healthy. The first place I lived, there was a giant billboard and it was for vegetable. I, I couldn't read it in Spanish, but all I saw was two giant, you know, jugs of clear, I don't know, is it brown or, or golden vegetable oil in the plastic containers and then a big picture of a heart. And they're literally telling people like this stuff is good for your heart. And, and people think that and they yeah. go and they buy it, they buy it by the tub and they cook with it and they heat it and it becomes, it becomes incredibly toxic. If you look at a map, but there's a map of the United States of where heart attacks are prevalent, where you have coronary artery disease and so forth. And that area follows right up the Mississippi River and through Louisiana. And, and what it turns out, the heart attacks in the United States are a lot higher in areas that eat fried foods. And so, you know, uh, hydrogenated oil, deep fried is one of the best things to give you a heart attack or coronary artery disease ever. And, and with uh, lots of the Hispanic foods, you know, when you used to make um, a tamale, a tamale was made out of pork fat, which is a whole lot healthier. It's not healthy, but it's a whole lot healthier than uh, hydrogenated Crisco. But now they just take Crisco and they mix it with cornmeal. And that is 80% of a tamale. And so it's gone from being mildly unhealthy to a uh, major poison if you eat a lot of it. And so it's, you just got to watch these things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bonkers. Um, you know, while we're on this topic, I, I just thought of this uh, – <clears throat> this thing. So, you know, I've, I've been doing my own research into this, in, into these, the idea of like saturated fat and, mm -hmm. uh, and saturated fat is demonized as being the bad fat. And I mean, I'm not enough of an expert to say, you know, saturated fat is good or not. I think it's better. You know, it's like, what is like, what is, what is good relative to what? Right. But I do know that when they come out with these studies and they say, see saturated fat causes 
heart attacks, you really have to dig into the, the actual methods of what they're doing in those studies. So one of them, I did that. And this study basically gave saturated fat to rats. And they know they observed that the rats that got saturated fat um, compared to the rats that didn't, um, they had cardiac events more uh, frequently. Well, when you actually dig into the method of what they use for saturated fat, they used corn oil for saturated oh. fat. They called corn oil saturated fat. And, and, you know, then they, but they don't, but they don't put that in the headlines. You know, I might've even found this through like a, like a, a news headline and clicked on the study and then brought it up in the sci hub. And, yeah. and so it's, it, it's like, you have to dig into that, the actual data because it's there. It's just not advertised. Well, there, there are some healthy oils. There's like coconut oil, there's olive oil, there's some oils that are really good for you and really healthy, but it's not the ones that like Crisco or corn oil or any of these inexpensive oils you buy in a grocery store. Yeah, avocado oil is also good. And what's horrifying, you look at any street food, they've got that big plastic container with that yellow, ucky oil. It just, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> Yeah, I used when I was in New York, I used to do these uh, walking tours around lower Manhattan and I would take people into Chinatown and I would go into Chinatown several times a week. And every single time I was going through Chinatown, you would just see somebody, I mean, wheeling these wear, uh, wheelbarrows full of canola oil into the Chinese restaurants. And that's what they're cooking with. And they're, they're putting it on these in these deep fryers and these grills and they're just reusing that oil over and over again and it's reusing it's brutal the oil, reusing the oil is very dangerous i even remember that from medical school that when you reuse the oil like for french fries it will change those bonds from like i guess cis to trans across and it's very carcinogenic you get trans fat that way so reusing oil you go into a store and they're reusing the oil for french fries that's trans fat and that's the fastest route to a heart attack you want to have a heart attack you do that there you go. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's brutal. And I think maybe one failure of the entire health system is the fact that we are so focused on macronutrients where it's like everyone's like, I have to have this much protein and I, and I can't have this carbohydrate or this fat, but it's really the ingredients. It's like, we need to focus on ingredients. It's like, you can have fat, but what is the fat? Is it olive oil or is it canola oil? Is it, you know, butter from a grass fed animal or is it, you know, vegetable oil that was made in a lab somewhere in Missouri, you know? Um, so I think if people shifted that focus to what is the quality, what is the actual ingredient that we're getting, then we start there and then we start to, we start to have a real conversation about health. Yeah, a comment on that is if you eat a lot of meat, eat too much protein, it'll convert into kind of sugar, raising your insulin, you'll have the same result as if you eat a lot of sugar. However, if you eat that meat with fat, you don't get the insulin spike and the insulin spikes, what you want to avoid. But if you're going to eat the fat, that's where all the toxins are stored. You know, in us, the toxins are stored in our fat and then same with animals. So you want to eat grass fed and make sure that they're not being getting the insecticides. I mean, we're giving arsenic to chicken to fatten them up. You want to make sure they don't have the hormones and uh, the antibiotics are fed. So even just eating too much protein can jack your sugars up in your insulin response, leading you toward diabetes. So eat it with the fat, but make sure it's healthy fat. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, when it comes to this, this idea of grass fed, um, even that's now starting to get bastardized by the food industry. And they're like, well, our stuff's grass fed. Every piece of meat you buy is grass fed. Is it grass finished? You know, because they finish these animals on corn and then they, they slaughter them and they, you know, this is the whole business model of the CAFO. But that has something to do, I believe, with with the with government subsidies in the corn, right? Because you know the government subsidizes the corn, and then all this yeah. corn, most of the corn goes to feeding the animals to begin with. Well, you see, back in the seventies, uh, right at the beginning of the seventies, uh, we reached a point where conventional farming would no longer feed everybody, so they had to come up with a method for producing lots and lots of food, whether it was good or not. And so you go to this massive corn subsidy and you have tons and tons of corn, which can be turned into feed for animals or all kinds of corn products. And, and you, you then 
uh, are living on corn. And, and that actually, they have a way of testing, like they take the average human being now, and you can take a sample of your hair, and you can you can actually look, determine what the what the hair was actually made from, what you know, what the human being was eating. And now you'll see that it's a lot of a, a ton of corn that make up our bodies. This cheap corn, if they subsidize it, ends up everywhere. Now, the thing about corn is 95% of it is genetically modified, which is a problem. And one of the people in our movie told me that he actually spoke to Obama's cook and t- talked about high fructose corn syrup, and the, you know, and the cook told this person that, yeah, Obama knows about it, but he can't do anything about it because of the corn farmers. Because the corn, because of the corn farmers or because of the, the government officials who manage that, that whole thing? Because Wherever he doesn't want to put the corn farmers out of work. Whatever, whatever the money comes from. But yeah. They, he knew, but he couldn't do anything. Michael Pollan writes about this in his book. Um, oh, what is it? Uh, one of his more popular books. I can't remember the name of it. Of the Omnivore, Omnivore's Dilemma. Yeah. And he talks about the corn subsidies and, and the corn farmers. And, you know, basically they're, they're just trapped in this, in this cycle where they have to raise corn because it's, it's, it's basically the, the way they get paid. It's, it's basically their welfare. Um, they get the money from the, from the government and they have to buy these seeds and, you know, they have to plant the government corn. And, and this is basically guaranteed income versus if they were just like their own independent farmer, they're kind of on their own, but you know, because I I don't know if there's land rights and things like that into this, but you know, there's just a lot of government control in the, in the growing of corn and, and they use these farmers, essentially, it's essentially it's a welfare system. Yeah. Well, they, they wanted to make a system where food would not be expensive. And so you actually have a lot of food that's not really a food. It doesn't really have any benefit for you, except it's something you can put in your mouth, like the corn and some of the synthetic of the wheat that they've made and so forth. But you have lots and lots of it. But if you look around at the people that don't spend a lot of money on their food and you see all kinds of problems with their health and massive obesity, if, you know, the uh, if someone lives off of corn and wheat and all of that stuff, they're going to become very obese, uh, especially if they drink all these sodas with the high fructose corn syrup. And so you see this huge rise in obesity, which uh, I feel like Susan to chime in on this, but it's actually when you get really tremendously obese, that's a form of malnutrition going on because you're eating a lot of food that has no nutrient. And so you're eating more and more and more just to get more nutrient that you need. What would you say about that, Susan? Well, I know that that's uh, Dr. I guess it was Dr. Glidden's theory or somebody's theory. Uh, but anyway, obesity is bad for you. Any way you go around, it's got all your toxins. It's, you know, it means you're highly inflamed. Oxidative stress is going to set you up for any cr- pr- chronic disease, depending on where your vulnerabilities are. Yeah, there was a doctor in your film. I forget which one. But he did make the the statement that it was like, you go to the cheesecake factory, you eat 3000 calories, and then you go home and you're still hungry. And, you know, I, I don't know the data on this personally, but I mean, there is something to be said that when you eat that much food, essentially, you're just eating cardboard, you're just eating corn cardboard, and your your cells aren't being nourished, you know, like I could eat, I could eat 700 calories of, you know, organ meats and good, you know, locally grown vegetables cooked in the right, you know, good fats. And I'll feel completely satiated, you know, but I could also go to McDonald's and I could eat 2000 calories of, you know, fried fat uh, or, or fried garbage and, and wheat and, you know, burger and all this stuff and, and still be hungry. I would still need to eat something. So, um, you know, yeah, I think I think the the phrase is um, what is it? Uh, fed and starving to death, or or full and starving to death, or something like that. You know, you just you just never satiated, so you just keep eating. Right, because uh, uh, Lyndon said that you had to have uh, ninety things every day, which was uh, around sixty minerals, and and then the rest is vitamins and amino acids, and so. I don't know if that's totally correct, but I do know your body has to have what what it needs to work. And you're not going to get that out of just eating, you know, cornmeal all day, especially from a GMO source. 
And so people that don't have a lot of money, they don't get really good food and they don't get nutrition. And then they have a whole plethora of illnesses derived from the fact that they are not nutrified. Yeah, and this is this is where the whole this is where the whole sick care system. This is this is why the sick care system gets its name because it's you know it's like the government gives you this subsidized corn food that you know I mean what's the the real cost of a burger or of you know of one of these food products should be um, you know much higher than it is. Um, I've seen the, the actual cost of McDonald's burger should actually be something like 12 or $15, but it's, you know, it's the price it is because of these subsidies. And, you know, it's like, it's like a, it's like a gateway. It's like a, it's like a drug dealer giving you a little, like a little taste, a little sample, and then you get sick and then you got to go to the doctor. And now you're on, now you're on this perpetual merry-go-round of, you know, this pharmaceutical, this side effect. And it just goes back to the beginning of this conversation, which is you, you jump on and it's very, very hard to get off. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, it's just, it's just tragic because what you, what you have is when you get on this food that doesn't have any nutrition and you eat a lot of it and you end up getting diabetes and then you end up getting all the complications from diabetes and it gets so bad that you're cutting off your feet, you're cutting off your, your legs because of the diabetes when if someone had good nutrition and they had good advice on what to eat and how to eat, they would have never been in that situation in the first place. So I think it's, it's really sad when you could, you know, you get someone and it's hard to get people to change because it's an addiction thing. They're addicted to this food. And so, but they'll keep eating it and it ends up with horrible health problems, you know, and you end up with someone in a wheelchair because they no longer have any legs or something because they just never got the food they needed. And the doctors didn't have the instructions set or whatever to tell them, hey, you need to change what you're eating. You need to go this way. And then, you know, Susan, what do you think about that? I want you to tell about your colleague that you were on the same health plane and you chose one route and the other and your colleague chose the route to have his legs cut off. Yeah. You know, and, and, there, and I, I, I would have been there probably if I hadn't learned what I learned. Yeah, what he's saying is that his health was pretty much equal to a colleague of his. And Alex obviously chose a route of trying to be neutrified. And the colleague nah, wanted to stay on his own path. And the colleague just had his legs cut off as a wheelchair. And they were in the exact same place maybe five years, four years ago. About seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's sad because I look at these people that are so sick and if they just knew or if they were able, I mean, choosing to eat the right foods is expensive and it's a lot of work figuring out because everybody's body is different and you have to figure out what's right with you. But there are generalities with the food you should eat to be healthy. And, and you know, you've got this big addiction you have to overcome because if you've been eating, uh, you know, sugary foods, high carb foods, and all this stuff that is programmed to make you an addict, and you try to go to eating things like spinach or healthy fruits, healthy salads, and all the things that are good for you that you have been programmed to think taste terrible, you have to overcome that and start eating good food. And when you start eating good food, you realize how terrible the food was that you were eating. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you know, a lot of people go down this addiction path with bad foods and they end up costing a fortune for medical care. And, you know, that makes a lot of money for the medical system, but it's really devastating for the people involved. Yeah. It's the mental manipulation of the food because it, it saps your motivation. It saps your will and it legitimately lowers your IQ. It legitimately um, manipulates your pineal gland, whether it's the fluoride or yeah. it's these different chemicals and you can't, you know, you don't, you, you don't, you don't have any more instincts, natural human instincts. Like mm -hmm. I love this analogy of us being animals. Like, you know, you see a deer in the wild go up to, you know, a piece of fruit on a tree and it knows it'll smell it. And it knows whether it's it, it to eat it or not eat it. 
And we have that same instinct. It's just, we also have this, you know, this ego, this front brain that won't let us rely on the back brain to make instinctual decisions like this. And the instinctual decision we make is, well, if, if a McDonald's burger is $3 or, you know, an organic salad with good meats and and good nutrients is $12, well, I'm going to go with the cheaper thing because it's, it's survival. Right. But like you said, they don't, you don't see the down, the downhill costs of now you're just starting to get on that path of in and out of doctor's offices and prescriptions. And then you become one of these people who has to wait in line at a pharmacy. And if you can't, let's say if you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. Now you're in a complete, you know, uh, area of disaster because because now you've been addicted to these substances and, and it's all by design. There, there's nobody yeah. questioning you guys are doing it, but there's nobody in the quote unquote mainstream questioning this. And sadly enough, if you do question it, uh, you end up on Google as a quack. They have the quack report <laughs> and right. a lot of doctors who I respect and, and I'm sure you guys, and I'm, I'm sure you guys know of, um, are on these quack reports and there's nothing quack about them. Everything they say is, is, you know, verified by science. Everything they, they, all they do is quote, you know, medical papers and research, but yet because they don't follow the orders from whatever the powers that be, um, you know, they're the ones who get labeled quacks. And again, it goes back to survival in the consumer's brain of, well, who am I going to follow the authority or am I going to follow somebody that makes me actually think independently? I would like to chime in here. Uh, you're talking about that we know what we should eat. When I interviewed Fred Provenza, he did a lot of work with animals, and the animals instinctively know what to eat unless you muck up their diets. But also he refers to studies that human beings, until they're two or three, will naturally go to the foods they need. But once they get the junk food interference from our society, they lose <clears throat> that ability. So he's saying children, before they get all this junk, can will go to what they need, but after the jump, no. And a way to live, I mean, get some of this food relatively independently, I mean, cheaply is the farmer's market. Mm-hmm. You know, you go there, they bring their wares, you've got organic everything, and that's probably the cheapest way to eat and it's probably the most healthy stuff. It's local and it's fresh. I love the farmer's market because A, the food is better for you. B, it actually tastes better. Like you forget what nutrition actually tastes like, but C, you're, you're, you're just giving money to the farmer. You know, there's no middleman, you know, there's no credit card machine. There's no, uh, you know, grocery store supply chain. It's just direct, you know, product to consumer and the farmers are better off and you're, you're basically paying with your dollar. Like to me, this is the most democratic thing we could do. You want to talk about democracy in the United States, pay, vote with your dollar and give it to the people who are doing it right. Well, the, the farmer's market food is fresh. That's one thing. You know, if you, if you go to a farmer's market, it probably was picked maybe a week before. If you go to a grocery store, it may be three, four, five weeks old. They've been refrigerating it. They've been actually taking a tomato that was picked green and spray food color on it. And so, you know, most unfortunately, most grocery stores do not have healthy produce. And so, you know, you go to some of the ones that specialize in healthy foods, maybe, but you have to be really careful about that. Another thing is if you, if you have the availability, grow the food in your backyard or something at home. Or if you have any way of growing food for yourself, you know, that's always helpful. Absolutely. And markets market take credit cards. The farmer's market takes credit cards. Oh, they do take credit cards. There you go. Well, you know, that makes things easier for some people. <laughs> uh, I think it's just the grocery store, you know, supply chain and th- that just gets in the way. And it's like you said, Alex, it's, it's, by the time it gets to you, it's already lost, you know, a good chunk of its nutritional value. And, you know, yeah. it doesn't, it's not food at that point. Well, it's sad because a lot of places are losing their farmer's markets. You know, in Dallas, where I live, I live actually north of Dallas. We had one of the largest farmer's markets ever, but they, the city decided it would be nicer if they turned it into another purpose. And so they closed down the farmer's market and put in something like a boutique area. They still sell food, but it's things like donuts and things like that and, and maybe women's dresses and so forth. So a large portion of the people that live near that farmer's market no longer have a farmer's market to go to anymore. It's awful. Yeah. And so they, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't have any grocery stores. The poor areas of town 
it's hard to find a place to get good produce for the people. Wow. Well, this has been, I mean, an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, like I said, I loved your guys' film. I encourage anybody listening to this to go check out The Big Secret. You can get it on Vimeo, I believe. Yeah, you go, to, go to the big secret, bigsecretmovie.com and it'll link you right to the movie. Great. And also, we'll put that I'd like to give a plug, the Silicon Valley Health Institute, that's svhi.com. We've got weekly Zoom meetings with experts so you can Zoom in and ask your question. Also, my radio show, Occupy Health, which is on Voice America, where I also interview all the experts who are going to say it as it is and not as the government wants us to say. That's great. I'm going to put those links in, in the show notes. You can catch that at holisticnotropics.com forward slash podcast. And, um, and then anybody listening can go there. You can click the links and then you can go check out the movie. You can check out Susan's uh, Integrated Physician Silicon Valley Health Institute Zoom meetings. You can check out her podcast. Um, so anybody listening to this will be able to find all of this information. And if you like me, uh, this topic of of the intersection of health and, and government and, you know, the, how do we, how do we, how do we build a better healthcare system? And, and I, I believe the big secret discusses that, you know, you go through the, you go through the, um, the, the, the metamorphosis of why we got to where we are now, but then you also leave us with the solution. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but um, I think we've been talking a little bit about it here today. So uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend it. And I, and it sounds like you're coming out with a new movie soon, or you're working on a new movie, which yeah. uh, it's called, it's called Toxified. Toxified. Uh, Do you have a, a release date for that? Two years ago. <laughs> oh, you have another. Oh, you have two movies. No, no, no. <laughs> Just, We've been working on it for a while, but things have been changing. But we're hoping to get the editing finished this summer. OK, so. yeah. cool. Cool. Well, there you go. You, you've been able to socially distance enough to, to hunker down in an editing editing doc and uh, and get it done. So we'll be expecting it soon. Both of us have been working full time. There's no social distancing or relief. I thought this would be a great period of meditative contemplation and, you know, just, you know, just a great growth period. Nah, it didn't happen. Right. <laughs> well, you know, as soon as that comes out, I'd love to have you guys back on to talk about that movie and, uh, and just whatever I can do to help you guys out. Uh, I think you have a great message and I, and, and more people need to hear it. So, um, Alex and, and Susan, thank you so much for joining me on the holistic nootropics podcast. Um, for more on Alex and Susan's work, go on over to holistic forward slash podcast, check out the show notes and all the links to their work. And we'll catch you on the next podcast. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.